Hi everyone, I'm sorry I'm uh, running a little late this morning. Uh, I actually made it to the supermarket <clears throat> and it was a, a little crazy over there, but uh, uh, sometimes necessary to, to venture out and, and get some, some needed supplies. So, uh, and if I cough, it's my allergies. I got this terrible post-nasal drip thing going <clears throat> and I'm just, uh, it's been a little rough today. So today, our third day, uh, for our Lenten retreat um, will be on on the Eucharist and I'd like to start off by of course uh, telling a story about our patron Padre Pio. So it was the middle of October 1911 and it was very early in uh, St. Pio's priesthood. He was accompanied by his provincial to the friary in Venafro, in the province of Campobasso, in order to improve his poor health. If you know anything about Padre Pio, especially the life of his early priesthood, uh, that he was very much ill uh, for, the, for the first part of his priesthood until he got to uh, San Giovanni Rotondo. Now, his stay in Venafro was brief. Uh, barely more than a month and a half. But during that time, it was noted that St. Pio Pietrocina lived on one thing and one thing alone, the Eucharist. What he shows us is something that we should know uh, with our whole hearts, that the Eucharist is our life, and it sustains us, body and soul, the bread of angels and the chalice of salvation. I think also, too, it's something that we, we recognize more and more now that it has been deprived of, uh, deprived of from us. Now, before this, though, if, if you remember, the church is and was and still is in a catechetical crisis, a Eucharistic crisis of sorts. Because as that study came out, it's estimated that about 70% of Catholics at the time did not believe in the true presence of the Eucharist. That they did not believe that through the power of Christ, working through the priest, that the bread and wine is confected and transformed into the body and blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And while we could spend the rest of our lives and even these past couple of weeks and into the future lamenting about what we as a faith have lost, we instead use what we have done here in our time of prayer together, even virtually, even the times of, of adoration virtually, to steal ourselves in this present moment and impel us for the greater glory of God. As Padre Pio wrote so beautifully, a thousand years of enjoying human glory is not worth even an hour spent sweetly communing with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament that the world is reminded that just like the manna in the desert, not by bread alone does one live. That just as the Lord freed the Israelites from slavery to Egypt, so too, through the Eucharist, the Lord can free us from slavery to sin and death. So we are called by our baptism to engage the world two-fisted, with the best that our 2,000-year tradition offers us and the tools and methods of today, the heart of the new evangelization. And, of course, this new evangelization, this participation in the body and blood of Christ, has two distinct parts of its dynamic. And I think we've been seeing this in, in what we've experienced over these, these past 14 days or so. The first is a conversion ad intra, 
which means within ourselves. And of course, without offending the piety of those present who are listening or those who will watch this later, we as a church are in constant need of, of internal conversion. And the culture and the world that we live in, we unfortunately at times have been infected by the laziness, complacency, and minimalistic attitude of the age. In the past, we have seen Holy Mass as a, a check mark, a, a weekly task that once completed can be placed back onto the shelf until next Saturday night or Sunday morning. I think in, in many ways, the fact that uh, the public celebration of Mass it has been temporarily suspended that the people and the priests have truly recognized the greatness of the gift and no longer take it for granted. Now, some of my more cynical brethren are afraid that after this crisis is over and things return to whatever normalcy that, that we are capable of, that people will prefer to have faith this way, the way that we're, we're doing this right now. That one does not have to leave one's home or can wherever one is to uh, just, you know, watch it and stream it and, and experience it virtually, one-on-one. -on -one. However, I believe it's just the opposite. I think that what we do here is a, uh, a primer and, and the things that we have talked about and the way that we have prayed is going to help bolster us that once we're allowed to come back together, that we can do that much more. That we're not just going to become Catholic televangelists, that there's going to be an opportunity for us to, to, to do and be more. And that, that'll come next. That'll come next. But it's important for us to realize that at times we've been distracted to the reality that Christ ham hammers home in his Bread of Life discourse. Now, if you don't know where the Bread of Life discourse is, it's in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. And just happen to have it here with us. Now remember that this dialogue between Jesus and his disciples happens after the feeding of the multitude so that he has given them earthly food to eat and yet they are continuing to search him out in order for him to feed them again. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? They're, they're trying to be sly. Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me. Not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So they said to him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, What sign can you do that we may see and believe in you? What can you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So he's making that, that important distinction between earthly food 
and, and what he is willing and able and readily gives to them. So they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me, because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Pay attention. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life, and I shall raise him on the last day. Once again, the Jews, those not really the Jewish people, but of course those that, that struggled to believe in what the Lord was telling them. The Jews murmured about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can we say, I, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. So Jesus at this point is laying down the foundation piece by piece of who and what he is as the Son of God sent by the Father. And even though he's laying out for them, even though they're, they're understanding exactly what he's trying to tell them, they just can't grasp it. They just can't attenuate it fully in their minds. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We know where this guy is from. We know his family. How can he say that he's doing the will of the Father, that the Father sent him, right? And then all this bread from heaven, blah, blah, blah. Come on. So he continues. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone who has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So here again, the Jews are, are about to understand exactly what he's trying to tell them, but they miss the point. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They understand it. They're thinking cannibalism. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. And just so the people understand that he's not talking in terms of symbol and hyperbole, he says this, For my flesh is true food and my blood is is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. These things he said, while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Then many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? Right, and Jesus lays it out again and again and again, you know, just trying to get them to understand fully what he's trying to do. And then they say, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. It was too much. 
It was too much. The concept of the Eucharist was too much. And then they walked away. So we're reminded and grounded once again in the reality that Christ is the living bread that comes down from heaven and his flesh is truly the life of the world. And we who participate in it and eat his flesh and drink his blood remain in him and he in us. Something that I know many of us are, are looking forward to very, very soon. And we too have to guard ourselves from the cynicism of the world that asks, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I think the time for, for cynicism and cynics are, are, are done. So we must renew our own dedication to our Lord in the most blessed sacrament. As Padre Pio writes, we must kneel down and render the tribute of your presence and devotion to Jesus and the blessed sacrament. Confide all your needs to him along with those of others. Speak to him with filial abandonment. Give free rein to your heart and give him complete freedom to work in you as he thinks best. This, of course, is the first and best way to enter into the constant renewal that is always part of the church. Nobody has ever gone to hell for loving the Eucharist too much. So I think if we do that, if we show our devotion to our Lord in the most blessed sacrament, then everything else will kind of flow from that. Now, the renewal of the church, especially in this time of crisis, is uh, not just within herself, ad intra, but the second aspect of conversion is ad extra, outside. Now, I know that's a little bit hard in, the, in terms of social distancing and the whole concept of us staying at home. That's why we're watching this right now. And, and we recognize that the world seems like it's entirely out of control and everything is beyond our reach and our capacity for change. But we know that that is not the truth. In fact, far from it. St. Peter reminds us is that even if the world were to capsize, if everything were to become dark, hazy, and tumultuous, God would still be with us. So even though we are not able as often as we should to be with the presence of our Lord in the most blessed sacrament, we take the Lord with us wherever we go to give witness to him in our lives. Now, if we take a look at the end of Mass, right, the, there's several things in, in English that, that we say, several phrases that we say. But if we take a look at the Latin, uh, that's part of the Roman Missal, third typical edition, of course. The end of Mass by the priest or deacon is ita misa est. Go forth. The Mass is ended. It's a command, right? It says, go forth, go out. Especially to the places where we, the priests, can't go. Like, I, I'm not in your homes right now, okay? So we have to take what we have received and evangelize in, in, our, own, in our own background, our, our own ways. And that's the model of sacramental theology, or at least one of them in the life of the church, that we receive the grace of the sacraments and from the Eucharist and go out into the world and bring our Lord's grace with us and how we live our lives and then they bring it back in. So it's this constant circle that we're renewed and refreshed in the Eucharist, we're filled with the grace of the sacramental life of the church, we go forth. We evangelize and we draw people to come back in to be renewed into the church, be fed by her grace and to go forth and over and over and so forth and so on. So we should not be afraid to confess our faith, even in these difficult times and situations, and that we have to do it out of a place of charity and love. Jesus did all because of love, and he invites us to love. Now I know many people are upset, upset at bishops, 
saying that they've shut down the church. Well, the church is very much alive. And what we're doing is for the common good and safety of all. If you take a look, you know, just as a brief aside, many of the outbreaks have happened because people have gone to church, because it's communal, right? So we have that, that uh, on the, on, I think it's in, in, in Portland, right, that there was a choir practice. 40 people showed up, 20 of them are sick and very sick. So, something to be mindful of. So even though it's difficult, and it's rough, and we're going out of our minds, right? Now we have to reground ourselves in our faith and to recognize the charity and love that still exists and that the church has not abandoned her mission, although many might think that we have. So, Padre Pio also says, the most beautiful act of faith is the one that is made in darkness and sacrifice, and with extreme effort. That's what we're doing right now. That's our, these are these times right now, okay? The world is dark due to sin and death, right? We've made countless sacrifices by staying at home, right? By giving up important aspects of our lives. And what we're doing here is extreme effort, Right, I, 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 I was just commenting. Actually, I was complaining. I'll be the first one to admit I was complaining. That all of these streaming things, which are very fruitful and, and I'm getting good, good, good fruit out of it, many blessings, at times has been a little hard, a little rough. Uh, I don't know how those YouTubers do it. You know, they're, they're constantly making new content. But this is not content, this is our faith. And what we are called to do in the world is no secret. Padre Pio tells us that Christ shows us our mission from our birth to despise what the world loves and seeks and to use the gifts and the things of this world in order to proclaim the gospel, to share the grace of the Eucharist, and to get ourselves to heaven. So that unlike our ancestors who ate and still died, nourished by the Eucharist, we will live forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for day three of the mission. Um, day four, I think we're going to talk about the uh, Holy Father's uh, prayer and, and talk uh, at his Urbi at Orbi blessing. We'll break that down a little bit and to continue our life of faith in these uh, interesting times, to say the, the, the least. Our, our next thing will be our holy hour at, at three o'clock, uh, and uh, we'll be praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Um, pretty much at the beginning of, of, of adoration. So thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to share. Uh, this will be on the YouTube page fairly soon. And uh, now I gotta go make lunch for the, for the rectory staff. Thanks and, and, and God bless you. Take care and we'll see you at three.